Good morning, this is Pastor Rick. I want to welcome you to the bonus Bible study for this Thursday, June the 10th. I'm excited because we're going to take a look at this important topic of the priesthood, being a priest, all of us being the priesthood of all believers. Uh, but before we get into our topic, uh, once again, the goals of the bonus Bible study are that first, we would read the Bible better, and secondly, to develop a Bible culture where we really have competency here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Now, for this topic of the priesthood, this is not just the bonus Bible study, but the bonus, bonus Bible study. You get two short tapes uh, as we approach this topic this morning. The first will be on the tabernacle in the Old Testament as we describe the tabernacle and the work inside the tabernacle. For the priests, we understand what the role and mission of the priests were much better. And then we're going to take a look at Abraham and this mysterious figure, Melchizedek, who came to Abraham and offered him, uh, Abraham offered to Melchizedek as a king and a priest, a tenth of all his possessions. Why did he do that? And what does that say about the priesthood? So first of all, let me read this one beautiful verse from 1 Peter 2. It's verse 9 where Peter writes, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we are all called to be priests. That's the vision right from the beginning of the Bible, which is why in the Protestant church we do not call our pastors priests. We call them pastors, which is uh, from the shepherding role of shepherding a flock rather than priests, because we say everybody's called to be a priest, and that's where we want to begin. If we under, want to understand the background of this call to the priesthood, uh, we go back to the tabernacle. And going back to the tabernacle, we're actually going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, because there God gives God's mandate to Adam and Eve to work and keep the soil. And that phrase to work and to keep is the same exact phrase that was used for the Levitical priesthood who worked uh, both in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. So let's first, as we're approaching this wonderful topic of the priesthood being a priest, let's first watch the video on the tabernacle. Enjoy. So if you lived in ancient Israel, one of the most important places was the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a sacred tent that the Israelites carried as they journeyed to the promised land. And it was sacred because it's where the heavenly presence of Israel's God lived on earth. And the tabernacle had an important design to show just how special it was. There's the outer courtyard then an entry room into the tent, and it leads into the center of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, God's personal throne room, and it's guarded by these heavenly hybrid creatures called cherubim. Notice, the closer that you get to the center, the more sacred the space becomes. The people who work in the tabernacle are called priests, and they care for the sacred space, offer sacrifices on behalf of Israel, and announce God's blessing over the people. Yeah, these priests represent God to the people, and they represent the people to God. So think of both the tabernacle and the priests who work in it like gateways that link together heaven and earth. And this is why the tabernacle was eventually brought up to settle on a mountain, because mountains are where earth meets heaven. Now, one thing that's missing in this tabernacle that you would find in every other ancient holy space are idol images that physically represent the God. Oh right, Israel's God explicitly commanded them to not make any idol images. And that's because in the Bible, all humanity is God's image. This is what we learn in the first pages of the Bible, where Adam and Eve, in Hebrew their names mean human and life, they're called God's image, which means they represent God in his holy space. And that holy space is a garden in a land called Eden. Yes, and the story is designed to show that Eden is the reality that the later tabernacle symbolized and pointed back to. For example, look close at the descriptions of Eden. There's the larger region on the land that's called Eden, but then within Eden, God plants a garden. And then in the center of that garden, God plants 
tree of life. The design of Eden matches the tabernacle design. Yes, and there are details in the Eden story that are developed much later in the Bible showing how Eden is on a high mountain. Because they're in a place where earth meets heaven. Exactly. And God tells these humans to work and to keep the garden. These are the same words that are used later in the Bible to describe what priests do in the tabernacle. So Adam and Eve are God's image and are like priests working and worshiping in a type of heaven on earth temple. Yes, they represent creation before God. And as God's image, they represent God to all of creation. And they do all of this in this sacred space that's saturated with the life and presence of God. And so God tells them to rule creation on his behalf. They're like priests who embody God's heavenly wisdom and rule here on earth. You could call them royal priests. Exactly. Now, this whole setup, the royal priests in God's presence where there's abundance and life, in the book of Genesis, this is called God's blessing. But it doesn't last very long. No. Humanity is deceived by this rebellious creature. They're unsatisfied with being images of God, and so they make a grab at being God, ruling creation on their own terms. And so God exiles them from the garden. And God places Kerovim at the door of Eden to guard the way back in. This is tragic. Humanity has given up the role God made them for. But it's not the end. The rest of the biblical story is about God's mission to undo this tragedy so that humans can regain access to the heaven on earth place where they can finally become God's royal priests. It all begins with a promise that God makes to Adam and Eve that he will raise up one of their descendants to rule over and defeat that deceiver. God says that this coming descendant will strike the head of that deceiver, but also be struck by it. So this priestly figure will restore God's blessing by offering up his own life like a sacrifice. But this is still just a promise. Yes, and so in the next story, we find the next generation outside of Eden. Two brothers at the door of the garden are offering sacrifices to God, kind of like priests. Maybe God will accept these offerings and they can get back into Eden. But sadly, one brother, Cain, gets angry because God favors his brother Abel's sacrifice. And so Cain murders his own brother. Then Cain is exiled even further from Eden and from God's blessing. And over time, Cain's anger plunges humanity into widespread violence. Humans really need that coming royal priest to rescue them. Yes, and that's the hope that this whole story is designed to generate. And so in the next few videos, we're going to explore the theme of this coming royal priest throughout the story of the Bible. We're going to see how the stories of Abraham and Moses and David all point forward to Jesus, who is the ultimate royal priest. Jesus, the one who will restore the blessings of Eden so that all humanity can become the royal priests that we're made to be, ruling the world together on God's behalf. Okay, we've just seen how the tabernacle defines or reflects, first of all, the ministry of the Garden of Eden, and then reflects a whole vision of the role that priests were to play and Israel as a nation. So now we want to take a look at some specifics of how this played out, especially between Abraham and Melchizedek. Now, often when we talk about Melchizedek, we talk about tithing. And I guess that's okay uh, because Abraham, in thankfulness, in gratitude uh, for Melchizedek and his blessing and his prayer, uh, Abraham offers him a tenth of all his possession. As we're going to hear in the video, Abraham just came back from a battle. And here, this Melchizedek is both a priest and a king. And he comes out and declares that God has given uh, Abraham this victory and blesses him. And remember, Abraham is always blessed to be a blessing. And then in response and in gratitude, certainly for God, but also the ministry of Melchizedek, Abraham offers him a tenth of all his possessions. And here's the thing, Melchizedek really isn't used to teach tithing as much as the role of being a priest, because as the New Testament will claim, he has got a higher priesthood 
one that reflects more the role that Jesus is to play than the Levitical priesthood. Again, Melchizedek shows the way of the whole priesthood of the nation even more than the Levitical priesthood. And so now let's watch our second tape on Abraham and Melchizedek as they teach us about priests. Enjoy the video. We are walking through the story of the Bible, focusing on the role of priests. And that story begins with God creating a garden called Eden. Where heaven and earth are one. And God places humans in the garden to be his royal image, his priests, so that humans and God can work together as one. And this whole setup is called God's blessing. But tragically, the priestly humans are duped into rebelling against God and then exiled from the garden. But God promises that one day a descendant will come to defeat that evil deceiver and restore humanity as royal priests. And we learn he'll be both a priest and a sacrifice. But as it stands, humanity is outside of Eden and things have spiraled into chaotic violence. But God chooses from the wreckage a couple, Abraham and Sarah. And God calls them to journey to the land of Canaan, and he promises to give them a huge family and all the blessings of Eden. Now, the blessing isn't just for them. The goal is that God's blessing flows through their family out to all the nations. And so that makes Abraham's family like a priesthood. So is Abraham that royal priest we've been hoping for? Well, no. But Abraham does meet a mysterious figure who reminds us of that promised royal priest. And who is this? Well, Abraham is returning victorious from a risky battle. And he passes by the city of Shalem, and this king comes out to meet him. And we're told that this king is also a priest who serves the same God that Abraham does. Ah, yes, Melchizedek. This man's a mystery. We don't know why he worships Abraham's God. We don't even know his family lineage. Exactly. But here's what happens. Melchizedek brings this great feast out to Abraham and his army, and then he gives God's blessing to Abraham, saying God is the one who gave him this victory over his enemies. Then Abraham gives Melchizedek one-tenth of everything that he has, and that's the story. So what is it all about? Well, Melchizedek is the king and the priest of Shalem, which is an ancient name short for Jerusalem. Ah, Jerusalem, which will later become the capital of Abraham's future family, where the temple is built. And that 10% that Abraham gives Melchizedek, that's just like the 10% Israelites will later give to honor the priests who work in the temple. Exactly. And so here is Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and he's honoring a royal priesthood that existed long before Israel's temple or their priests. Ah, Melchizedek. Yeah, he's super important. And we'll come back to him when we get to the story of David. Okay, back to Abraham. We find out that he and Sarah are unable to have kids. And they're really old. So how are they going to have a family? Well, they scheme up their own plan. Sarah forces her Egyptian slave to produce a child with Abraham. But once that happens, Sarah ends up despising her slave and oppressing her. So instead of trusting God for a family, they do it on their own terms. Right. And so God eventually does give them their own son, Isaac. But then God promptly asks for the life of that son back. Abraham is called to offer up Isaac on a mountain as a sacrifice. And we're told this is a test. God's requiring Abraham to own up to his failures, to stop his scheming, and to surrender his family's future to God. Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain, build an altar, and right as Abraham is about to offer up his son, God stops him, and he provides a substitute ram that can be sacrificed in Isaac's place. And here, the narrator stops the story and starts speaking to you, the reader, saying, this is why we today say, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. The mountain of Yahweh, that's Jerusalem. That's right. And so notice, in both of these stories we've looked at, Abraham is near that high place that will later be called Jerusalem. In the first story, Abraham meets a royal priest. And in the second story, God provides a substitute sacrifice that covers for the sins of Abraham's family. Yes, and both of these stories point forward to the need for a future royal priest who will also become a sacrifice for the sins of Abraham and his family. From here, Abraham's family grows to become an entire people. 
but they eventually end up as slaves in Egypt. And so, how can a group of slaves produce a royal priest? Exactly. And so that brings us to Moses, whose story we're going to look at next. 